everyone, and welcome to Therapeutic Handling Basics. This is a lecture in Occupational Therapy 236, OT with Youth, and my name is Melissa Kay. I'll be your instructor. Let's go ahead and get started. And just so you know, you might hear a jingling in the background. That would be my neighbor's dog, Zamboni, uh, who is crying unless he's in my office with me. So we'll try to not be too distracted by that. All right. Well, welcome to this lecture. I created this lecture, and this uh, is an addition to the uh, traumatic brain injury slash therapeutic handling labs that you'll be doing as part of OT236. I added it because I felt like students were not getting just a basic introduction to handling techniques. Some of the things that kind of come before the neurodevelopmental treatment and the proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation uh, techniques and labs. And so it's a, a way to ground you in the material that's to come. So hopefully that will be helpful. You want to know that uh, you know that this lecture and even the labs that we're going to have are not going to make you a handling expert. Uh, that skill develops over time, and primarily with apprenticeship and continuing education to get that expertise. So. Put this in your back pocket. You'll be able to use it when you start treating clients, and you'll likely want to get further education. We have three objectives for today. Uh, first of all, just to describe the basic practitioner considerations when using therapeutic handling with clients. Second, to explain general guidelines when engaging in therapeutic handling. And lastly, to practice the variety of skills, including observation, therapeutic use of self, body mechanics, hand and body use, and communication that are really necessary and kind of the keys to successful therapeutic handling with clients. All right, so the basics. Therapeutic handling influences quite a lot of other things when we're um, practicing intervention with our clients. It influences the quality of motor responses. And, you know, as you go through this lecture, think about um, people with um, traumatic brain injuries, but also people with um, cerebral vascular accidents, CVAs or strokes, and a variety of other issues that may impact um, both the body and the neurological system. Uh, therapeutic handling is matched to a client's abilities. It includes the client's ability to use sensory information. So it's not just motor, but it's also sensory. And that sensory information enables the client to adapt their movements. And we'll see that both in um, NDT and PNF, that uh, some of the input that we provide can actually change the way a person is uh, able to move their body. And then it involves neuromuscular facilitation inhibition and a combination of the two. So sometimes we're wanting to facilitate more movement or a different kind of movement. Sometimes we're trying to inhibit um, abnormal movement patterns and often we're trying to do both of those things. There are four traditional sensory motor approaches, and we're not going to go into detail about them in this lecture, but suffice to say that we will be covering some neurodevelopmental treatment, or NDT. It's also known as the Bobath approach for Berta um, and Carl Bobath, who invented it. Uh, also, neuro, uh, proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation, or PNF, the Brunstrom approach, which is also known as movement therapy, it's okay, puppers, and the Rude approach, which is a sensory motor approach to handling. So some how-to general information. First of all, you want to get thorough training before you embark and on your journey of utilizing any of these in a really significant way in practice. You need to use careful clinical reasoning to match the, uh, the, the client's needs with uh, the handling techniques and look at your outcomes. You also want to practice quite a bit 
and then also tailor all the techniques that you're using to the individual client and their condition. So it's uh, it's a very um, precise and and directed kind of intervention. First up are practitioner considerations and safety. So in a in a therapeutic handling video, why are we why are we considering the OT's body mechanics? Well, um, in a, when you use your body as a tool in any capacity, um, there is a chance that you could hurt yourself if you're not engaging in safe practices. So here are just some basics, which you may already know, and if you do, that's great. Um, and at this point, I'll also let you know that um, the, this video has an accompanying slide deck, and on the slide deck are presenter notes, which will give you additional information about the topics that I'm discussing in the video. So be sure to check that out. All right, body mechanics. First, you want to hold a load close to your body. That includes a human being, right? So if you're holding somebody at arm's length, you run a greater risk of both harming yourself and also not having sufficient strength uh, to effectively engage with that client. Use a broad base of support. So typically, um, feet and legs are about, hip, uh, are about shoulders width apart. You want to move as one unit. So rather than engaging in, in a segmental turn or, or movement, you want to keep your shoulders to your hips pretty much as one movement. That's going to engage your muscles and also help prevent injury. You want to lift with your legs and not with your back. Um, most of us know that at this point, but um, it bears mentioning that your your quads and your hamstrings and your hip muscles are much stronger and more uh, can take more um, punishment, for lack of a better word, than your back. So be careful of that. Avoid twisting and bending and also avoid quick or jerky movements. So all this combines to say that you want to move um, carefully and you really want to plan out and have an idea in your head of what your um, movement will entail so that you can be prepared for it. Here are some OT movement and positioning considerations. Um, and there are some little pictures that help you out with that. First of all is body alignment. So we're going to be working with client body alignment, but it's very important that we have um, a symmetrical and upright alignment and that we're not engaging in any holding or um, compensatory techniques because of an injury ourselves, or if we are, that we're aware of it, because it's going to throw our body off a little bit. And we want to be in proper alignment so that when we handle another individual, say with a transfer, um, we're actually doing that safely. We also want to be aware of our center of gravity, which for most people is um, at or slightly below the navel and in the center of the body, both um, left, right, and front back. Our center of gravity is where um, our arms and legs will move from and around. So it's important to know that and to note that. Also important to note that in your clients. Base of support, which we just went over, typically um, shoulders width apart for your feet and legs, maybe slightly wider. Also body balance. So when we're, um, when we're carrying a load, be it another person or something that we're lifting, um, we, we are shifting our balance because we have this weight that is typically in front of us. And so we want to um, act accordingly so that our body remains in balance. The other thing that will happen is that the line of gravity, which if I'm standing up um, with both feet on the floor and my arms by my side, is straight down through my body. But as you can see from the second picture here, the line of gravity, if I have raised one of my legs off the ground and I'm holding my arms out, has shifted. And so the line of gravity goes at a diagonal. These are just things to keep in mind as you're starting to work with clients. It also bears mentioning to get help as needed. And again, I know most of you know this, but just as a reminder, Never lift more than you're capable of. 
there's no uh, there's no um, reward for hurting yourself because you've lifted more than you can actually handle. Uh, ask for assistance. Use equipment when necessary, and there are a variety of different types of equipment that will help in particular with transfers. Transfer boards, gate belts, a lift, an actual lift, a sling, which is often part of a lift, and other types of equipment. I, it, I should note that um, in this uh, in this video and in this class, we do not cover transfers. We actually cover transfers in an uh, in another class. But um, because we're handling and because we're moving around clients, um, it's part of the basics. All right, preparation for handling. So there's a bunch of things that we want to think about. We want to think about the environment our observation of our client before we even touch them, the sensory needs of the client, and where our focus is. So let's get into a little bit of depth on some of those items. Observation involves looking and seeing what position the client is in, where their posture is like, uh, their alignment, their facial expression, which can tell us a lot about how they're feeling, or at least we can make a hypothesis about how they're feeling, their affect, their apparent energy level, etc. Now we wanna be careful not to assume that because a client is smiling, that means they're happy, right? Um, it may be a grimace. It may be that they're smiling because it's polite, but they actually feel really terrible. So we're not gonna make assumptions, but we're gonna use the information that we're given to at the very least, um, come up with some hypotheses about how our client is doing. We also want to use our auditory system. Uh, we can often hear the client's respiration, which can be a clue to discomfort or, um, or calm, alternately. Any vocalizations that they make, um, if they're moving and they're grunting, for example, or, um, or sighing, and any verbal communication. Finally, we consider kinesthetic and proprioceptive observation. And this is qualitative information about how the client is moving, any movement patterns, any synergies, and their responses as we um, enter into therapeutic handling, their responses and the feedback to what we're doing. So all three types of observation are important. Then we want to consider the environment. How bright is it? Are there fluorescent lights? Sometimes those bother people who are sensitive to light or are uh, prone to seizures. What is the noise level like? Some people prefer a noisier environment. Others really need the calm and quiet in order to focus. Is the temperature neutral? Is it warm? Is it cool? Again, uh, different people are going to function to different capacities based on that temperature. The characteristics of any materials you're using. So if you have, for example, um, a, uh, a, a mat table that has vinyl on it and that vinyl is sticky to the client or um, it feels cold to the client, anything with any of the materials that you're using can be considered part of the environment and we want to be aware of it. Also, how much space do we have in our treatment area? And that applies to both um, the, the capacity for the client moving potentially in larger ways, as well as the privacy of the client. And, um, you know, it's vulnerable to have somebody um, working with you and actually handling you. So privacy is definitely an aspect of this. And then finally, the social milieu. So who else is in the environment? What are they doing? Um, is it a distraction? Are they off on their own? Can we, um, can we get some sort of barrier between us and them? All of these things are considerations that we want to attend to in the environment. Some will be able to change, some we may not. Next, we want to consider the client context. There are a lot of contextual um, issues that may come up. They may be, again, an issue they may not. So first, um, we have culture. So 
uh, individuals from various cultures may have um, more or less difficulty allowing someone to touch them. They may have more or less difficulty with someone of the opposite or same gender um, touching them. They may have um, a variety of customs or beliefs around interacting with a stranger um, in a more intimate way, which touch obviously is. Also age. So if someone is quite a bit older than we are, um, that may present an issue. It may be just fine. Alternately, if someone is particularly younger than us, um, that may present a challenge or it may be just fine. Excuse me. So next we want to consider gender identity and expression. Both of the client and of the therapist, same goes for sexual orientation. So um, therapeutic handling is not sexual in nature. Uh, it's not erotic in nature. However, if a person has a traumatic brain injury, they may be prone to sexualizing. Um, if someone has not been touched in a very long time and um, many of us can uh, can relate to this just from living through a year and a half of COVID where we were very isolated from many other people. Um, touch can, uh, can trigger emotions, right? It can also trigger discomfort. So gender identity and expression, are you a match? Are you not a match with your client? Um, may or may not be more comfortable or less comfortable or a non-issue. Same thing with sexual orientation. And um, from the both the client side and the practitioner side, we may or may not choose to reveal um, our sexual orientation or our gender identity. So we want to be um, we want to be very sensitive to that. We also don't want to make any assumptions. And when in doubt, we want to very um, thoughtfully and respectfully ask. And finally, history of trauma. So. Working with um, clients who have a history of trauma or who, for that matter, have experienced a recent trauma that um, contributed to the reason that they're seeing you, right? So if you've had a traumatic brain injury as a result of an assault or a rape or something like that, or even an auto accident, um, that is a traumatic event. And so that can impact how touch is received and overall how safe the client feels. I'm going to sound a little bit like a broken record, but it's beyond the scope of this lecture to talk about how to um, touch and respond to trauma. We can definitely discuss it in class, and we try to embed um, trauma-informed care and awareness of trauma throughout the courses in our program. So if you have questions, um, please, please ask. SAMHSA, um, which uh, is a mental health organization, I'm losing the acronym for it, uh, is a great resource at S-A-M-H-S-A, -S -S I believe. Um, and they have some guidelines to trauma-informed care. And there are some guidelines uh, throughout the course of this um, course, OT236. So a lot of information for you, but it's definitely a client consideration.